Hi, we're Simon and Nikki Mills and we're part of Hope Springs Church and we just want to share a story of hopelessness transformed to hope, uh, revolving around our youngest daughter, Sarah. When I was 20 weeks pregnant with Sarah, she's our second daughter, uh, we went to our scan um, and, you know, normally when you're going to that scan appointment, you're really excited because you're going to find out what sex your baby is going to be and we were we were convinced we were having another girl um but we weren't sure anyway when they started the scan um the technician was quite quiet because there was obviously something wrong um but she um couldn't tell us what was wrong all we could see was her stomach looked like a balloon and um and her lungs were really small um so she told us not to go on google um, and not to try and find out what's wrong, but wait until we saw the fetal medicine doctor, which would probably be in about a week's time. So obviously we were devastated. We didn't know um, if our baby was gonna survive until that next appointment. So we went home, um, we told our family we were having a girl, but we didn't know what was wrong. She was poorly. So then on the Friday, uh, a few days later, we went for um, appointment to see the fetal medicine doctor and she diagnosed our daughter with something called fetal hydrops um, and she told us that there was no hope she literally said the words there is no hope um, your baby's got about five percent chance of survival if that um, and there isn't anything that we can do um, and straight away like obviously we were absolutely devastated to hear the words that there's no hope um, but straight away we just said well we're not we're not going to terminate this pregnancy because we we want to give her a chance and if she's fighting then we're fighting for her so they just said okay that's fine we will just we'll give you some blood tests we'll try and find out what the cause was um and they did um a couple of weeks later i didn't want to have the amnio synte oh, i can't even say the word the amniocentesis uh to find out if there's any genetic causes for the hydrops um, I didn't want to have it at that early on, at 20 weeks. I wanted to wait until um, she was a, a viable pregnancy, so 24 weeks. Uh, so if anything did go wrong and I went into preterm labour, then I knew that they would try and save her. Whereas if she came before that, I knew that they wouldn't. So we waited until the 24 weeks until we did that. Um, but then all of the tests came back uh, that they were negative for anything they couldn't figure it out they didn't know what caused it so they still said you know well we don't know we don't know when she's gonna we just don't know so yeah we were told there was no hope but we chose to carry on and to try and hope and there was that quote wasn't there from uh sam says it in lord of the rings doesn't he while there's life there's hope yeah we so that, we? yeah so we've been watching um lord of the rings and yeah, so it was where there's life, there's hope, and that's what we chose to cling to cling on to. And I was I put everything out on Facebook to our friends, and I just requested, you know, prayer. You know, like just stand with us and pray. And um, sometimes, you know, some days it just felt really dark, and like that we had we had nothing, but the fact that we had people supporting us really helped because they held us up. And I think that was really important that other people were hoping for us when we felt like we couldn't anymore. Yeah, that's yeah. it. So, so a lot of the time, yeah, it was very dark, wasn't it? And we, we did feel kind of the depths of hopelessness, like where where we should have been rejoicing about the pregnancy at that scan and getting our little picture and everything. Mm. That actually, it was just such a a sucker punch uh, that knocked the wind out of ourselves, didn't it? And you know, oftentimes it was the kindness of our friends, our, our church community, um, our family, just walking us through those dark days, wasn't it? Mm. So. Um, yeah, we were we we got to the point of being utterly hopeless, but just like plodding on. But like we refused to give up on the be on on Sarah. We refused to kind of even contemplate the idea of terminating the pregnancy. But it was oftentimes just getting through the days. It was either Emma's joy, her, her ridiculous joy, or our friends kind of leading us by the hand through those days. The, th the thing with it was, I mean, obviously pregnancies are those things that we, we kind of have no control over and it actually started to get worse um, before it got better. Yeah, so we were having weekly appointments. Um, we'd go in and see the fetal medicine um, doctor once a week to have scans. 
Um, so at first she had something called bilateral pleural effusion. So she had fluid around both of her lungs, so crushing both of her lungs. And she also had something called ascites. So she had fluid all in her abdomen. Um, but then it started to go under her skin as well. And it got all up her back and her spine. And it was around her heart as well. But then not only that, I started to develop um, fluid as well. So it's something called mirror syndrome, um, which also puts you at more of a risk of having a stillbirth and also it's quite painful so it's giving me contractions so it was pretty it was pretty scary like not knowing what was going on and um having to you know count her kicks all the time to make sure that um she was okay and like so trying to hope but also living in a little bit of fear that you know what what if she's not okay I haven't felt a kick for a while so it was it was quite dark at times but you know having other people like you know encouraging us really did help as well didn't it yeah because some days it was literally holding our breath until the next kick wasn't it yeah and we then we did meet with um the baby doctors um who work in the icu and we met with him and then they organized getting steroids for her lungs um but the first time that we met with him he showed us to the icu and he was talking about how if she's born when she's born um the things that they're going to have to do to her when she's born so like having like needles put straight into her to try and drain the fluid so that she can breathe they might have to resuscitate her you know take her away straight away so it was all very like very scary and not knowing not knowing when when it would happen um or how it would happen and um them saying that they weren't going to interfere in the pregnancy they were just going to let her go full term and then things did actually start to improve so by 32 weeks fluid started to just disappear like and they couldn't work they they didn't know why um and emma, and emma like so our eldest daughter she was what how old at the time she was um two at the time and she used to just kind of come out with these most amazing statements like just randomly out of nowhere she'd say look mommy i see the water disappearing yeah she said the water's disappearing the water's going away and she was only two, so she didn't know what was going on. And it was just, we were just driving along and the water's going away. And really? That's so weird. And another thing, I um, I had a dream. It was just really strange. I had this dream that um, she came and um, I, I dreamt that she was seven pound, two ounces. And I dreamt that she came naturally. And uh, I dreamt that she looked like her sister. And I can't even make it up. She was born on her due date and she was seven pound, two ounces and she looked just like her sister. It was, it was crazy, yeah. but so. Yeah, so, <laughs> so like from, from week 32, the, the, the fluid started disappearing in various areas of the body. So the, the thing with the fluid is, is that it actually literally crushes the development of, of this tiny kind of body in, in the womb. But then it started disappearing from various areas of the body and, and the specialist kept telling us, you know, like it could be cycling, it could be moving from one area, so maybe from the abdomen to by the spine or into the head or into the, the, the cavity, you know, the heart is in like a little bag and they're worried that it was going to go in there. And, and then what week was it that it just kind of disappeared? 37 weeks, all the fluid had gone, except some, of, some was up her spine. But not only the fluid in her had gone, also the extra amniotic fluid that I was carrying was also gone which they could not explain because that doesn't normally resolve doesn't until happen. like the baby is born. And so to put it in context, so talking to the specialists at University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire, so, so that's a fairly big regional hospital and they'd only seen, I think, um, three cases in the last five years. And they said by far, like Sarah's was kind of the most um, threatening because she had developed fluid in so many different areas of her body. Um, at such a young kind of age in, in, in the development cycle and um, so and then it just started disappearing and, and nobody had a reason for that at all because that just doesn't happen. No so we met with the baby doctor again which is the specialist in the ICU and um, he was he was actually really amazed and he was like well things have changed now um, she's very unlikely that she's going to have to go to the ice uh, the ICU uh, or is it the end the baby unit yeah yeah, no. yeah neonatal um very unlikely that she'll have to go there um but we still don't know if she will you know come out breathing or not so we do have to have the baby doctors all present so but yeah so just kind of the, the waters disappearing and um, was kind of miraculous wasn't it yeah so 
so yeah, um, I asked to be induced on her due date because I didn't want to go any further. I thought, you know, we've kept her in there long enough. Let's just get her out. And if she needs help, she can get the help that she needs. So they took took me in on my due date and they induced me and it didn't take very long. It was a 19 minute labor and she came so fast that she came in the induction room. Um, so the baby doctors weren't actually present. They were all supposed to be there. So obviously I was in shock because it had all happened so quickly and she came out and she was crying and she cried literally for an hour. Um, and they just put her straight on me, which was amazing because I didn't think that that would happen. I thought they were going to rush her off and she'd be away from me and I wouldn't know what was going on. Um, but yeah, they put her straight on my chest, uh, like on my chest. Maybe we'll share that picture. But she was born and she was on my chest and she was crying. And I just I just couldn't believe that she was here and she was OK and that she was breathing without any help. Take her off just to be checked over. Um, and she came back to me about half an hour later and they said that she was absolutely fine. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. You know, there's nothing that they can see. I mean, they did say something further along the line might come about, but we, we just don't know. But she seems fine. So you can have her. And 12 hours later, we were home. <laughs> you know, we went from ta being told that our baby was going to die to being home with a healthy child. And the only thing that she has wrong with her is she's got um, a split split. Uh, she's got diastasis recti so her tummy is bigger than normal but other than that it doesn't cause her any problems so yeah it was it's just amazing but that's her story that's her tag isn't it that's Sarah that's special. Sarah's special tummy we call it Sarah's special tummy but yeah so now we after that we wrote some cards um to send to people after she was born um and I wrote about hope in these cards you know like always hold on to hope you know I know there are situations where you know babies don't survive but the fact that you know she did it it's, it shows you that you know you hold on to hope and it can you know things can miraculously happen so i sent this card to uh, the fetal medicine department and um the, uh, i found out uh, a few years later actually um that it was there on the notice board because um a mother got in touch with me because she'd seen some um, tags on Instagram about fetal high drops and how I'd shared Sarah's story. And she told me that she was in Coventry as well and that she'd been to see um, this consultant and that um, she, the consultant took her to the, the notice board, pointed at the picture of Sarah and said, there is always hope. And this is the consultant that told us literally that there was no hope for our Sarah and now she's pointing at Sarah's picture and telling Sarah's story as a story of hope for other mothers. So yeah that is amazing really because I can't even tell you how hurtful it is to be told that there is no hope. Having no hope is just such a dark place to be in so now that this consultant does tell mothers there is you know hold on to hope it's just it's just amazing and I'm just so grateful that um that Sarah survived and that um, she can bring hope to hopeless situations. And so now you're, you're, you're part of a, a community online, aren't you? Like mm. supporting other mothers and well, other fathers as well, I guess, with, with children who are developing with yeah. fetal high drops. And to be, to be fair and to be sure, like not, not many of the, the kids make it, um, but during the pregnancies, you're able to at least talk to them. And, and it's not kind of, um, a vacuous empty hope it's actually just keep going because you never know and sometimes just that those words of comfort from you can can help them through that situation yeah. even if it's to help them through to actually grieve properly isn't it? Mm, yeah and I mean a lot of there is a lot of grief in this situation um, but I have I haven't been through the grief situation but having spoken to people who have they still tell me that this story of hope has brought them so much comfort 